Hello again, Psych 370 students, and welcome to another video lecture for week seven. In my previous video lecture, I talked about what we call the three-term contingency in operant conditioning, right? Which I told you that you can think of as an ABC kind of association. So remember, the way that works is the A stands for antecedent. So that's what comes first. That's the discriminative stimulus. The B stands for behavior and the C stands for consequence. So with operant conditioning, it's basically A plus B equals C. If the antecedent occurs, so if that discriminative stimulus is present, and if the behavior also occurs, then the consequence occurs. So I talked about that in my previous video lecture, but in this one, I'm gonna focus specifically on the consequence part of that three-term contingency by talking about a few of the different types of reinforcers that can strengthen an animal's behavior. And there are some important distinctions that we can make there when it comes to those reinforcers. First of all, one important distinction for us to make is between what we call primary reinforcers and what we call secondary reinforcers, okay? So there are primary reinforcers and then there are secondary reinforcers. Now guys, primary reinforcers are defined by the fact that they don't require any prior learning before they can reinforce a behavior. They don't require any previous conditioning before they can strengthen the behaviors that they follow. For that reason, primary reinforcers are also known as unconditioned reinforcers. Some people call them unconditioned reinforcers. So as I've illustrated on the slide here, some good examples of primary or unconditioned reinforcers would be things like food, water, and warmth. Because you don't have to learn anything first for those consequences to reinforce your behavior, right? You might say that they are innately reinforcing consequences. We're born with instinctive desires for those things. That's what makes them primary reinforcers. But not all reinforcers are like that. They aren't all reinforcing from birth. Some reinforcers have to acquire their abilities to strengthen the behaviors that they follow. So reinforcers like those are known as secondary reinforcers, or sometimes we call them conditioned reinforcers. So they aren't reinforcing at first. They start out neutral, just like the conditioned stimulus does in classical conditioning, but they become non-neutral. They acquire reinforcing properties because we learn to associate them with primary reinforcers. So for example, none of us were born with an innate desire for money, right? Money started out for all of us as a neutral stimulus because after all, it's just paper and metal. But money has become non-neutral. It's become a secondary reinforcer because throughout our lives, we've all experienced many pairings of money with primary reinforcers. So we associate money with things like food, fun activities, cool toys, and so on. And it's because of those associations that money is able to reinforce our behavior. So people like money because they associate money with all these other things that they like or that they need. And so they're willing to do things like work that produce money as a consequence. In fact, money is actually an example of a special category of secondary reinforcers that B.F. Skinner called generalized reinforcers. So what Skinner meant by that term is that we don't just associate money with one primary reinforcer, we associate it with many different primary reinforcers. And that vast array of associations between money and other things that we like makes money a very powerful reinforcer. Still though, at the end of the day, it's still a secondary reinforcer. And that means that if it ever lost its associations with those primary reinforcers, then it would also lose its ability to strengthen a behavior. So for example, if the apocalypse started tomorrow and people could no longer exchange money for goods and services, then money would cease to be reinforcing, right? People wouldn't care about money anymore. They wouldn't associate money with those primary reinforcers anymore. And so they wouldn't be willing to do things anymore that produced money as a consequence. 
So all secondary reinforcers, even generalized ones, depend on their associations with primary reinforcers. And if you extinguish those associations, then that secondary reinforcer will basically just go back to the neutral stimulus that it started out as. Still, having said that, secondary reinforcers can be quite powerful. Like I said, money is a very powerful, very potent reinforcer, and secondary reinforcers also have certain advantages over primary reinforcers that can make them more convenient and more effective, especially when you're training a new behavior. So for example, something that dog trainers will often do is what they call clicker training, which is where before they start teaching a dog a new trick, they'll first get the dog to associate something neutral, like the sound of a clicker, with something that isn't neutral, like a treat. So first they put the dog through classical conditioning, right? They'll click the clicker, then give the treat. Click the clicker, give the treat. Over and over again, they pair those stimuli. And then eventually the dog learns to associate the sound of the clicker with the treats. And so at that point, the trainer can use the clicker as a secondary reinforcer. That way they don't have to reinforce the dog with treats or some other primary reinforcer every time it does something they want it to do. They can just click the clicker instead. And guys, that's helpful for several reasons. For one thing, if you're using food to reinforce the dog's behavior, then before long, you're gonna run into the problem of satiation, right? The dog's eventually gonna get full. It's gonna get satiated on the food. And once that happens, the food won't be as valuable to the dog anymore. It'll be less effective at that point as a reinforcer. But obviously the dog isn't gonna get full on the sound of the clicker, right? So satiation is less of a problem with it. And as long as the food still occurs at least intermittently after at least some of the clicks, then that sound will retain its ability to reinforce the dog's behavior. So satiation is often less of an issue with secondary reinforcers than it is with primary reinforcers. And another advantage of using the clicker as a secondary reinforcer is that it can be delivered immediately. So right after the dog does what you want it to do, you can click that clicker. You can present that secondary reinforcer immediately instead of after a delay like you'd have to do with a primary reinforcer. And also another advantage is that with the clicker, the dog doesn't have to stop what it's doing. The clicker is not gonna interrupt the dog's ongoing behavior. But if you give the dog a treat, then it will stop what it's doing. That primary reinforcer will interrupt the dog's behavior because it's gonna to wanna to stop and eat the treat. So even though secondary reinforcers do depend on their associations with primary reinforcers, there are all sorts of advantages to using secondary reinforcers. And that's why trainers often do use secondary reinforcers like clickers when they work with their animals. Well, in addition to that primary versus secondary distinction, another distinction that we make when it comes to reinforcers is that there are natural ones and then there are contrived ones, okay? Natural reinforcers and contrived reinforcers. Now guys, natural reinforcers get their name from the fact that they naturally follow a particular behavior. They follow it sort of automatically. They occur as a natural consequence of the behavior. So no one has to set these consequences up. Nobody has to make any sorts of special arrangements to make it so that these consequences occur. For example, when I mow my lawn, the smell of freshly cut grass and the look of a neat manicured lawn are natural reinforcers for that behavior because they automatically, they naturally follow that behavior of mowing the lawn that I've performed. So that's how natural reinforcers work. But by contrast, contrived reinforcers don't automatically follow a behavior. Instead, with contrived reinforcers, someone does have to arrange for them to occur. So for example, a parent might set up a contingency with a child where if the child studies for a certain amount of time, then that child is allowed to play video games for a while. So the video games are clearly the reinforcer there 
But obviously, video game privileges are not a natural consequence of studying, right? Studying doesn't automatically produce video games as a consequence, so the parent is using those video game privileges as a contrived reinforcer, most likely to try to modify the child's behavior to make it so that they study more often. So since they only follow the behavior because someone deliberately arranges for them to do so, contrived reinforcers are also sometimes called artificial reinforcers. So natural reinforcers are automatic, right? They occur as a natural result of the behavior. They don't require any outside intervention to make them occur. And artificial reinforcers are contrived. Someone does have to arrange for them to occur as a consequence of a behavior. Okay? So I hope that makes sense. But of course, having said all that, it's often the case that a particular behavior can be reinforced by both natural and contrived reinforcers. So for example, I mentioned earlier that there are some natural reinforcers that follow from me mowing my lawn, like the smell of the freshly cut grass. But if my wife also gives me a kiss or a cookie or something like that because I mowed the lawn, then she's adding contrived reinforcers on top of those natural ones that I already get for that behavior. Or here's another example. Let's say that a novice golfer is just learning to putt, okay? They're learning how to perform a proper putting stroke. Well, if they perform that behavior the right way, then not only do they get natural reinforcers for it, like the sight and the sound of the ball dropping into the hole, but their fellow golfers or their teacher might also praise them for it, right? They might say, hey, nice one, or oh, good going, now you're getting it. So kind of like I talked about last time, where a behavior like studying could be considered to have both positively reinforcing and negatively reinforcing consequences, it's also possible for a behavior to produce both natural reinforcers and contrived reinforcers. Okay, well, if you have any questions about those different types of reinforcers, then please let me know. But that's gonna do it for this video lecture. Take care.